Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here, also known as ETCG1 on this channel. And hey, of course, if it is your birthday, I want to wish you a very special happy birthday. Just something I do here on ETCG1. Today's topic, analog versus digital. And I'm just going to preface this by saying that this video may jump around a bit. This is like the third time I've shot this because each and every time I do shoot it, I think of something else or something I forgot or something I wanted to say that I didn't say. Uh, so I'm hoping to get it right by taking all these things that I've shot and putting them together into one cohesive video for you to watch and think about. Now before I make too many words, the genesis of this has come from uh, some of the uh, comments that I've made about some of the choices that I've made with the Fairmont project that I'm sitting in right now. This is my 1979 Ford Fairmont. For those of you not familiar with it, I'll post the link in the description to the playlist that covers the build videos. I started my career right around the time that there was the changeover going from the analog systems to the digital systems. I just came in at the tail end of it. I, I started my automotive career in the early 90s and there was a, a changeover happening. Things were going from carbureted systems to emission controlled carbureted systems into fuel injection. At the time, fuel injection was difficult to manage and, and would be really expensive to put in everyday vehicles. However, as I said, the changeover was happening. But I remember getting a mix in the shop of both carburetors and early fuel injection systems, including mechanical fuel injection systems, the old K-Jetronic systems, things like that that would stop in from time to time. Those were fun. In school, they, they were teaching this to us. They knew this was coming. So I was fresh out of school, so we, we'd had some you know, fuel injection training, we had uh, um, O2 sensor monitor training, you know, we had, we had that stuff that was happening. It's a lot more so today because, let's face it, like the cars coming out today are heavily into electronics. So what is the benefit that we get from the digital world that we have left behind in the analog world? Fuel injection does offer a lot more control. But the argument has been made that it makes more power than something analog like a carburetor. What I think this comes from, I think it comes from a place where there's just unfamiliarity with carburetors. Let's face it, carburetors are still used on vehicles today. I still get emails from people in other parts of the world where there are new vehicles being produced still with carburetors. Also, when was the last time you saw a fuel injected weed whacker? Carburetors are still around. They're still a viable fuel delivery system. And designed properly, set up properly, they can have a long, fruitful service life. And the thing about carburetors is it's, it's long time proven technology. It is analog technology, yes. It is mechanical technology. And personally, I find that to be something that appeals to me. I mean, electronics, like I said, I'm not opposed to fuel injection. I, I don't have a problem with fuel injection. It's, it's, it's got its place. But in this build, I wanted a carburetor. I wanted something simple. And for me, simple is, if I'm having a fuel delivery issue, I can go out there and poke around and figure it out. It's not like I have to go through the software, find a bad sensor or a bad value or something like that. Yes, I know there's self-diagnostics that can help you work through those issues and you can look at live data and get a lot of information from that. Electronics do offer you lots of information, but without the knowledge to know what to do with that information, you're kind of just as stuck as you are as not having tools to work on things. That knowledge is equally important. And those carburetors were doing the same thing that fuel injection is now doing long before fuel injection showed up. Therefore, it's had a lot of time to develop. Now, granted, early carburetors on Asian vehicles, such as Hondas and Toyotas, those things were a sea of vacuum lines, more like a bowl of spaghetti than anything else, and very intimidating to anybody lifting the hood on one of those. And I worked on those when they were still relatively new. Now, they were complex, Rube Goldberg type systems, but they were effective. They weren't as good at handling emissions and rather complicated and expensive as a result to try to meet the emission standards of the day. Fuel injection made that so much easier. Electronics made that so much easier. It trimmed all that stuff down. You don't see nearly the amount of vacuum lines underneath the hood now as you do back then. So that is because of electronics. Also more accurate fuel control is a result of those electronics. Great things. But my argument to that is 
it makes them fragile. So we have this measure of control and we know like the position of the crankshaft down to the nanometer <laughs> and we know when to, when to fire ignition events or when to add the fuel or how much to add. Direct injection has, has taken that even a step further. Point being is digital systems make it possible for us to have like high horsepower vehicles like the Hellcat, things like that, and still be able to pass emissions. So electronics have come along and they've changed the analog world and they've made it, uh, some would say, better. And in many ways, I think it has, because the advent of the digital world has brought us things like, I said, multi-port fuel injection, which brings us the ability to make power out of an engine and also as good a fuel economy as we can possibly have through manipulation of not only the fuel system uh, and the ignition system, but also the transmissions. It's, you know, a lot of people forget about transmissions being an integral part of, of fuel economy and engine performance. Uh, in order to leverage the power an engine makes, an engine makes power within a certain window, you know, a certain RPM range. So they want to try and maximize that engine's power uh, and under as many driving conditions as possible. And electronics have allowed us to do that. They've given us the ability to go in and say, okay, we want you to shift now, but only under these conditions. So whether we're past 80% throttle, uh, we're going to uh, you know, change the shift points so that it can downshift into second, whatever. The whole strategy is to make it, so like I said, so that you can have the best driving experience possible, so that you can get decent gas mileage, so you can have it all. And that's what the digital world allows us. Electronics have brought us all these great things, but here's the problem. Whenever you have a problem with that immobilizer system, it's super expensive. Whenever you have a problem with that fuel injection system, well, it has its own self-diagnostic features. It gives you codes, places to start, but anybody that's done this for any length of time knows that yeah, just because you have a code, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, perfect example, just because you get a code for an O2 sensor doesn't mean you got a bad, an o, bad O2 sensor. It could mean that the system's running lean or rich. So it does give you a starting point, unlike back in the day where you used your skills to figure out the old analog systems and you, know, you heard that particular noise and you knew to look in that particular area. And that's, that's where a certain skill set came along for, for auto repair. And I'm not saying that modern technicians aren't skilled because they're using electronics. Um, they're using the tools that are available as we always have as technicians. My point is, is those electronic systems, at least to me, are fragile. And they can become weak in the sense that one little piece gets off or one little part of the program, some glitch in the matrix, is off. And what do we get? We get a no-go situation. Here's a really good example. I've, I think I've brought this one up before. Speaking of Hellcats, uh, an episode of Fast and Loud where they wanted to add a Hellcat engine to an older vehicle. And they went through days, called up experts and had them come out to try to set that thing up so that it could even run. And, and I went through this with Oliver when I first started out. I was originally thinking about putting an EcoBoost V6 in there. But one of the things that held me back was at the time, there was nobody out there who could put together a standalone system for me to run it without it looking at the instrument cluster, it looking at even the radio, it looking to see if the immobilizer had not been disabled. So that, that's modern systems, the way they're set up. If, they, if the immobilizer system says, meh, I, I don't like what I'm seeing, this isn't the right key, that's not the right person, <laughs> don't start. I mean, it's an anti-theft, it's a deterrent, and yeah, it has kept down on theft, but at the same time, in that situation, it, it seriously works against you. In fact, I've got an email box that's often filled with people that have replaced almost every sensor in a vehicle trying to diagnose a problem because they feel the sensor is at fault. And they completely ignore the fact that the, that the engine itself is a mechanical device and could have a mechanical problem causing the very issue that they're having. And it's something I've said over and over in my performance videos, is I've said things like, don't forget about mechanical. And it's often overlooked because there seems to be this binary viewpoint when it comes to analog versus digital. It seems that if you're born post 85, you are, you're a 21st century digital boy or girl, as the case may be. And I get it. I, I, you understand it, it's, it's what you've grown up with, and you, and you look at old mechanical systems like carburetors as antiquated technology. My carburetor, particularly on this vehicle, is far from antiquated. It was designed by computers. It was designed with flow in mind. It was set up to be an amazing fuel delivery system, designed and built in the 21st century. So it is not an old piece of kit. It's tried and true technologies that are implemented, and 
create what I feel will be a more than viable fuel delivery system for this vehicle. The dyno video is already out, 575 horsepower, come on. I mean, do I need more than that for a street? A lot of you are looking at this as a completely different project. This is a street car, okay? I will be driving this on the street. I'm not building this as a full-on race car. I'm, I'm kind of being a jerk on the street, you know, bottom line when it comes down to it. I've just, I've got something that'll run with Corvettes, that'll run with uh, most things that are out there on the road today. Uh, and those people that think they have something, well, I might have a little surprise for them. That's what this car is. It's not, you know, a full-on race car where I'm going to be sitting there logging data every quarter mile or going to the racetrack and doing the slalom, you know, taking shock readings and all that stuff. No, that's not what this build is. This build is something different. In fact, it was supposed to be just a naturally aspirated V8 to start with. I decided to spice it up a little bit with a turbo, and I've got to be honest, that decision right there cost me a lot of money. Not just for the turbo, but for the rest of the build, because the engine made as much power as it does. It makes it so that I have to beef up and rethink the entire rest of the vehicle. But that's part of the fun of hot rodding. And that goes back to tuning my carburetor. I don't have a problem with tuning a carburetor. It's not difficult. And even somebody in the comments posted, if you're afraid to get dirty, to undo a few bolts and change a jet or make an adjustment on a carburetor, what are you doing? You know, I, I realize this is a generational thing and there's a new generation coming along that all, they, all you really have to work with is electronics. All you've really ever known is electronics. You've really never known or played with the mechanical systems in the same way some of us older generation people have. And that's a shame because, because of those, under, those experiences with those mechanical systems, I'm gonna argue that in many ways, we really truly understand those systems, like on a visceral level. Not that people that understand electronics don't understand it because, I mean, right down to the electrons and the, the voltage values and everything else, I realize, I get it, that, that you're trying to get that pulse width dialed in just perfect at that RPM and the ignition to boot. You know, trying to squeeze every last ounce of power out of that system. You can do that. But what I'm saying is, you got to sit and figure out when enough is enough. So what is better, analog or digital? Well, to summarize, in my opinion, like I said, digital, you have amazing control. You can do a lot of things with digital. And you can make changes with digital in some ways, way more quickly than you can to mechanical systems. Mechanical systems sometimes involve rebuilds and, and rethinking and retooling to do. Whereas electronic systems, sometimes you can just sit there with a laptop, change some values, and poof, you got updated systems with updated parameters. Great. But when it comes down to breaking along, down along the side of the road, and you're not going anywhere, and you've got a sensor that's faulty, whereas if you've got just a small mechanical device that, that might have broken that you could possibly fix along the side of the road. I would say in that instance, analog wins. Analog has serviceability. Analog has uh, just the mechanical side of things that is the heart of the whole system. I mean, that's, you, can't, you can't rule that out. You can't rule out that there's an analog lump of metal underneath all those electronics. And those electronics are just there controlling it. And they're just doing what they're told to do. Mechanical systems, a lot of times, will give you warning before they fail. Electronic systems, I could just wake up one morning and be dead. And that, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, there's pros and cons to both sides of the systems. And I don't want you to think that I'm just pro-analog all the way, because I'm not. I, I embrace the digital. I, I make a living off of YouTube. <laughs> Okay, I started doing videos uh, while I was still a mechanic. So, I, you know, I've embraced the digital world. I, I haven't said that it's bad, it's evil, it's, no, I'm, I'm not that at all. And somehow in the comments that have been made about this, I, I feel that way. I feel like that I am strictly analog and totally behind the times and without a clue. That's just people talking out their butts in the comments. I get that. but. My response is, in a sense, this video and how I feel about electronically controlled things as opposed to mechanically controlled things. The analog versus the digital. Both have pros and cons. And I'm very curious to hear about what your thoughts are on it. I'm not sure where I made the cuts <laughs> throughout the video. It, it all worked out how it was supposed to work out, but that's the point I was trying to make, just to put this discussion out there. And as you know, since I've shot this video so many times, I've been wanting to, to say these words for a while. And I hope 
uh, we can have a discussion about this and it doesn't have to be, you know, we're, we're not reaching for our weapons. <laughs> we don't need to. It's just a conversation, okay? Let's, let's treat it as such. Anyway, if you have automotive questions, I'd ask that you head over to airthecarguide.com. I'll put a link in the description to make that easy. I'll put links in the description to other things that I've discussed just to make it easier for you to find them. Google+, Plus, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram will also be linked in the description, which is where I ask you to go if you wish to connect with me socially. Close each of my videos, including ETCG1s with Be Safe, Have Fun, Stay Dirty. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk at you next time. See you.